The United States is now more divided than it has been at any point in American history, including the Civil War. If it feels to you as though this political split has been growing constantly, that's because it has. Political parties and their increasing tensions have created a polarizing atmosphere across American households where family discussions turn into heated debates. The polarization that has been highlighted in recent years stemmed from the product of our history. The election of President Trump may have called attention to accentuate this divide, but he is ultimately not the reason it started. Democratic and Republican speakers cater to their sides and pin themselves against each other in races constantly. America has always been, and continues to be, divided at its core. Dissatisfaction of the government has created a striking polarity that we need to mend through monitoring our own media consumption, education on history, politics, and current events, and limiting as much biased language as we can in our own discussions. When running campaigns against each other, political opponents quickly turn into adversaries or enemies. We saw this heat up in the 2016 election with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Political parties need to get money, so candidates gear away from people who tend to be in the center of ideology and gravitate towards radicals to increase their donations, ultimately boosting their campaign. Additionally, tight elections lead to bigger, more toxic campaigns. You could likely remember that many young voters and adults alike, and even kids, since most of us were in middle school, didn't like Trump or Clinton as their first choice, but justified voting for one over the other as though they were the lesser of two evils. In a democratic competition against two adversaries, each one acted as though the other was a threat to the country's survival, and voters ended up seeing things this way as well. This set the national tone for the next four years. Americans on both sides of the spectrum express great dissatisfaction in the two-party system. The general public continues to show a split from parties, an increasing number of people registers independence each election cycle. <clears throat> two things that we have to separate are the political sides and supporting a politician. Republicans and Democrats can't be tied down to a single president or officer. There are plenty of self-proclaimed independents that devotedly support Trump and plenty of Republicans who voted for Biden in the 2020 election. More importantly, parties and ideologies are not the same thing. Using the terms Democrat and liberal interchangeably may not seem to pose any issues, but it meshes together two separate entities. Parties are designed to place candidates in office and are influenced by a population's changing ideologies in order to gain their support and boost their campaigns. In order to understand the deeper portion of where our political divide comes from, we need to look beyond the two-party system game and into some political ideologies. Let's delve into the basics of everyone's favorites, liberalism and conservatism. But before we do that, I want you to picture a liberal. When we think of a liberal, we might think of a younger voter, someone in a minority group, or even a teenage girl with blue hair. Now I want you to picture a conservative. When we Think of conservatives, we might think of huge uber religious white families that live in the middle of nowhere or teenage boys sporting camouflage and a Blue Lives Matter flag in their rooms. Let's take these stereotypes a step further though and look into what people really believe. According to the TV show Real Time with Bill Meyer, Republicans think that a third of all Democrats are LGBTQ plus and Democrats think that 44% of Republicans make over $250,000 a year. The percentage of both these demographics are much lower than they're perceived to be. Around 6% of Democrats claim to be a member of the LGBTQ community, and according to some websites, only 2% of Republicans actually make over $250,000 a year. Conservatism has now been associated with being American and liberalism with hating America. Despite how American either of these parties are, we split ourselves as if the other one is foreign. Conservatives and liberals simply have two different visions of America, and they tend to love their distinct one while subsequently hating the other. When looking at the definitions of these ideologies, they're just sets of beliefs that don't imply any danger. Conservatism is often defined as a philosophy that promotes traditional social institutions, and liberalism is a philosophy based on liberty, consent of the governed, and equality before the law. American liberals can often be seen as open-minded, taking stances against racism, homophobia, or other injustices, but ideology is a spectrum and there are plenty of people who would fight against that claim and rant on about the intolerant left. The main difference between these two ideologies is that the liberal ideology in America focuses more on how to protect others and the conservative ide ideology in America focuses more on how to protect ourselves. Both of these factors are incredibly important when it comes to voting and making decisions. 
Liberals want a better America or one that consists of less systemic racism and economic barriers. Conservatives also want a better America, one that preaches independence, hard work, and pride in one's nationality. Ideology is a spectrum, leaning towards one side and radicalism are two vastly different things. With all that being said, how do we begin to untangle this mess? Let's start from the roots of our problem, media and education. Our environments teach us what to think rather than how to think. Given the amount of opinions that surround all of us on a day-to-day -day basis, it's inherently difficult to decipher if we draw our political conclusions ourselves or if they're ingrained into our heads by the content we consume. The most notable factor that exacerbates this polarization is the media. Infographics, tweets, and even news sources are filled with so much bias that they lead us all to following propaganda, whether we realize it or not. Donald Trump was the first president to create such an ever-present image of himself on social media while in office, which has driven today's media politics through the roof. To comprehend the effect of the media a little bit more, let's talk about social media. Applications and sites such as Instagram, Facebook, and even TikTok function off of what is called a positive feedback loop. This is basically a system where an A creates a B and that B creates more of that A. For instance, when someone creates a post with a goal to raise or validate a certain opinion, this ends up creating more posts with the same purpose. This creates echo chambers when social media algorithms push users deep into content that they align with that's not designed to reach a stopping point. It's a little hack into human psychology, driving us all to seek social validation. In addition, many social media sites have been called out for leaving false information unchecked, like 4chan. This is dangerous. If people are led to believe things that aren't true, but a positive feedback loop is involved, then there's no stopping a train that's already gone off the rails. Our worst perceptions of the other side become uncontested, and the spiral into tribalism within United States politics only grows deeper. That's what we saw at the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. Hundreds of thousands of Americans were led to believe that the 2020 election was fraudulent and that Mike Pence could possibly change the results of the election and allow former President Donald Trump to remain in charge. The influence that the media carries is real and cannot be ignored. How can we get rid of polarization, though, if it's deeply embedded into what we consume? While the First Amendment is arguably one of the most American qualities within our country, Americans don't share the same size platform. News outlets such as Fox that don't have to be fact-checked can go on as far as our crazy relatives during family reunions, but have the power to influence millions of people across the country. This allows freedom of thought and facts to become entangled. While the First Amendment needs to be protected, it inevitably allows for misinformation and hate speech. However, just because an individual or group can spew hate or lies, that doesn't mean that their words will go without consequences. Depending on where you live, the, in the image and media pushed out by political agendas have striking effects. When I visited Lake County a few months ago, I saw ads on television with scare tactics to the population about Joe Biden raising taxes if he were to be the president. The ad demonized him in a way by morphing his image into a leader planning to take from the poor, not actually explaining his tax proposals or who they would affect. In low-income areas, just stating that a presidential candidate would raise taxes can be enough to get res residents voting for and even advocating for the other side. We all believe that we are smarter and more politically aware than any previous generation, but we need to look deeper into how much we're actually thinking on our own. I don't know about you, but whenever someone on the internet preaches that our political education is our own accord and must not be restricted to social media, I don't usually know where to start. It often seems that if that opinion has overtaken fact and even the most reliable news sources, and a trustworthy one is harder to come across than ever before. Solving the growing crisis of media in the information age is a large issue to tackle, but we can all contribute with our individual actions. The next time you pick up your phone and scroll through social media, ask yourself if the information you're coming across is verifiable. If you catch yourself falling down a hole of social feedback instead of useful information and aren't gaining anything from what you're consuming, switch to a new source, hit unfollow, or do some reading of your own. Here's something I don't want any of you to forget though. The social media realm deals in rhetoric and not policy. Education is the keystone piece of mending political divide, so keep yourself full with facts before falling into opinions. Since another one of the factors to mending this divide is education, we need our school systems to educate students on accurate American history along with current events. 
As you're all very familiar with, history is one of the biggest subjects that we study throughout our years as students. Understanding history, the context of our, of our democracy, is essential to keeping up civic participation in the future. History shows us patterns of the past and serves as a reminder that it's our job to break the cycle of history if we want a better world today. We all know that America is not a country without its own faults. Learning about the mistakes of the past from colonization to internment camps in the 1940s reflect the horrific events of our history, but acting as though they never happened erases what the American experience was for millions of people over hundreds of years. Reflecting on the scary parts of our past makes us stronger and demonstrates how we can make our country and even community more inclusive today. What people are taught in school becomes their influence. Ignoring the, uh, ignoring the events of the past could instill the notion that our country is perfect or could go as far as glorifying colonization and imperialism like some of our European history textbooks still do. Understanding the country in an honest way gives students a real interpretation of where we are now and ultimately leads to more informed voters and citizens. This makes studying where we are today of high importance. Teaching facts first is what helps students draw their own opinions rather than someone else's. Teaching the effects of different policies and allowing students to debate on them from an objective standpoint allows them to be better informed decision makers. When students come home from school or online school, they bring what they learn to the dinner table. Many of us may feel the need to educate our family members on what we know about politics or social justice, and having those conversations can be difficult. When dinner discussions turn into heated arguments, we can take specific points of ideas and put them at the front of the line. When it comes to an argument, other parties at the table can only look for the most extreme, leaving out the other reasonable beliefs and propositions held and contested by moderates in each party. Calling people ignorant doesn't change anyone's mind. The problem with getting rid of bias or polarization is that you can't get all of it to truly go away. What we are taught to believe when we are young shapes our worldview, opinions, and how we view others. How can we return to these civil discussions though when race and human rights are up for debate? Politics become more difficult when they're increasingly about the people or demographics. This blends policies and human rights, which in many cases do go hand in hand, making it difficult to always find the right things to say. To avoid polarization in speech, we have to make our language softer and allow for nuance. When talking about your own feelings or venturing into territory that feels a little unknown or maybe even false, try to redirect your own claim or someone else's with passive claims or phrases like it's possible that or it might be instead of sticking with it is and throwing your fist down on the table. These subtle changes in how we talk to each other shape our arguments into discussions that can be much less divisive. As bad as it sounds, attempt, when attempting to break down someone's biased or bigoted beliefs, it's still best to use passive language because that's what really gets through to them. If they can't answer your questions, they, might, they most likely haven't been thinking on their own and may not even know what they're talking about. Forgetting the nuance in situations and situations danger is dangerous, and that's the game that these two sides on the American political spectrum will naturally continue to play. Try not to fall victim to that and see the subjectiveness in both sides of any argument, debate, or better yet, conversation. When talking about America as its status of a form of democracy, it's now impossible to have this discussion without including details of the 2020 election. After President Joe Biden was called to surpass 270 electoral votes, Donald Trump and some of his administration continued to push baseless claims of voter fraud and asked for recounts in states that turned blue by surprise, like Georgia and Michigan. The Department of Homeland Security stated that the 2020 election was one of the most secure in our history. Even the conflict of his family became public, with certain members telling him to stand his ground while others told him to concede. Joe Biden's campaign has preached unity over division as one of its core values, uniting Democrats and moderate Republicans alike. Now that he is the president of the United States, how much can he make this claim hold up? And more importantly, how much can the rest of us make this claim hold up? In order to solve these problems, we have to consider the importance of civic participation as an American value. This country may not be as divided as the media makes it seem. While large-scale systemic change is necessary to create progression, individual contributions are arguably just as important. The next time you come across politically charged content, which is likely going to be very soon, I want you to keep the following things in mind. Now is not the time to give up on politics. 
We cannot continue to idolize politicians. One officer cannot fix all of our problems. And being involved in creating positive change and inspiring a good natured way of American thinking is up to the body of the citizens. A free America should allow for freedom of thought. The left should not be about hating the right and the right should not be about hating the left. It's important for us all to fight for what we truly believe in, not what we are being told, and to fight for these values and beliefs in an educated way with an understanding of both sides. We are born with reason. Let's not throw that away.